Um, I'm just going to wait another moment. I do see that there are a few people still in the waiting room. I'll, I'll start within the next minute. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, where we'll be exploring the cell shares in residential property owning companies. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Andreas Tsangarakis. I'm a director and attorney with STBB. I practice from our Claremont office. Uh, I've been admitted as an attorney just shy of 10 years, and my primary focus areas are mergers and acquisitions, uh, corporate restructuring, and advising on property. Um, although my primary focus is on commercial and industrial property, um, I do specifically advise on residential property sales, specifically in the context of the sale shares in those residential property owning companies. Okay, let's, let's kick off. There will be some house rules which will be posted in the chat. Um, it would be grateful if everybody could Observe those as we go along. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to pop them into the chat. And um, at the end of the presentation, um, I'll look to address as many of those as possible. I anticipate that the chat today will take anywhere sort of between 25 to 35 minutes. It will leave us with questions for 10 to 15 minutes or so, and then we'll close off. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, so. <clears throat> Just, just to give some context into our discussion today, uh, there are two ways in which a purchaser can acquire an interest in immovable property. The first is what we typically refer to as an asset strip, uh, which is the conventional route, okay? Um, and I'm specifically talking about it in the context of where a purchaser acquires property from a company, all right? So an asset strip would be where the company disposes of the immovable property out to the purchaser. Now, that is your conventional conveyance and transaction. Uh, your buyer would buy the property and there would be an entire deeds office process that, that would need to, to accommodate that. Uh, what we will be speaking about today is the second scenario where the purchaser acquires shares from the seller who, owns shareholding in the company that owns the immovable property. So if you draw a diagram, effectively what would happen is, is the shareholder who holds shares in the company is disposing of their shares to the purchaser. There is no transfer of the property because the property continues to be held in the name of the company. The purchaser simply swaps out the existing shareholder, becomes the new shareholder in the company and in turn enjoys all the benefits of the company's asset, which would be the immovable property. So for purposes of today's discussion, we will be focusing on point number two. Um, it's something that comes across my desk frequently. Uh, it, it can be structured in a very straightforward and, and simple way. However, there are instances where it's, it can be somewhat complicated and, and I'll look to highlight some of those complications uh, for you to, to take into consideration. Okay, so why would you acquire the shares uh, as opposed to the property itself? Uh, first and foremost is it, it, it's often driven by the seller. Uh, what may happen is for, for tax purposes, uh, the seller may decide that it's cheaper, it, it's, it's better for them to rather sell the shares in the company as opposed to the company selling out the property, which was the conventional route uh, which I spoke about earlier under point number one. Um, for tax purposes, for whatever reason, it may simply be more tax efficient for the seller 
to, to dispose of the shareholding in the company to the purchaser. The, 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 the second driving factor is liquidity. So for purposes of today's discussion, liquidity is simply cash event, okay? Um, I, I will speak about it in detail as we go along, but in an absolutely perfect world where you have a company that owns immovable property, the property is not bonded, the purchaser doesn't need to raise finance to acquire the shares in the company that owns the property. Uh, in a perfect world, those a transaction of that nature can be concluded within anything between two to five days. All right. Um, I, I will speak about I will speak about that in a moment. Um, so, summary: it's it's primarily driven by the seller. If it's more tax efficient for them, uh, they they will look to to rather sell the shares than sell the immovable property out of the company. Uh, secondly, liquidity: you can get your cash out far quicker. Uh, then having to wait the usual eight to 12 week process that's accompanied by the deeds office and all related parties that are involved in a conventional sale. Um, if you structure it on the basis where it's it's a sale of shares in a, in a, a residential property owning company, um, and as I said, there are no bonds involved uh, because effectively there is no transfer of the property itself, but rather a transfer in the shareholding in the company that owns the property the, you, there's no reason to go into the deeds office. Um, property continues to remain in the name of the company. Uh, there's far fewer third parties that you need to involve, such as the city of Cape Town. Because the company continues to hold the property, you need not concern yourself with procuring a rates clearance certificate, which, as many of you know, can take some time. Um, you don't need to go into the deeds office, as I have mentioned, and you know, as a result of going into the deeds office in the conventional sale, not only would you need a rates clearance certificate, you would also need, a, among other things, a transfer duty receipt. So although transfer duty is payable um, on the acquisition of shares in a residential property owning entity, which I will deal with in, in a separate slide, um, it's, it's not something that, that need help hold up uh, the process of selling those shares in that company. Also, because it's not a transfer of property, you in fact do not need to involve attorneys. It would be prudent if you do so. Um, as, you, as you may be aware, in order to transfer immovable property, uh, only conveyances can do so in the deeds office. But again, because one wouldn't be going into the deeds office because of the structure of, of the acquisition, uh, one wouldn't need a conveyancer to, to, to administer this. So in fact, if it's an absolutely straightforward sell and purchase of shares where there are no, uh, where there are no bonds, um, one can in fact run a transaction like this um, between parties without needing to involve attorneys. As you will see, um, it will be, it's recommended that attorneys are engaged because there are a couple of pitfalls and the like, but one of the, uh, another significant advantage of going with the structure of this nature is because it's not a conveyancing transaction, but rather a share transaction, you also are not going to be paying the conveyancing tariff fees that would traditionally accompany a conveyancing process where you're selling the property out of the company. Okay. Um, as I've mentioned, just on the fourth bullet point over there, um, on the diagram, if you drew one earlier, there is no actual change of property ownership, only the shareholders change. So, I mentioned earlier that it's it's in a perfect world, what you would have is, is you would have a company that owns immovable property. It's the only, in a perfect world, it would be the only asset that sits in, in, in that company. Um, buyer buys the shares from the seller who owns the shares in the, in the property owning entity and transactions of that nature, as I mentioned, can be wrapped up anywhere between three to five days. It's, it's, it's really straightforward and, and simple. Uh, there's some due diligence that one would need to do in the background, but it most certainly wouldn't, it shouldn't take as long as your conventional conveyancing transaction. Um, for all the agents who, who may be joining us this morning, um, that's a great way to, to possibly consider um, a, uh, receiving your commission sooner um, than having to wait for the entire deeds office process to follow in a conventional sale. Now, having, having said all of this, it sounds fantastic, um, but 
and this is why it would be prudent to engage with attorneys, is transactions of this nature are not without their risk. Okay. Um, in a conventional sale, typically what would happen is you would simply acquire the property from a company and you would move on. All right. And the seller who, who owns the company would, would need to sort out the tax affairs of that of that company and, and settle any liabilities that may be in the company that sold the property to you. However, where you buy into the company and you acquire its shares, not only do you buy into the existing assets, which for simplicity would be the immovable property, you also buy into the corresponding liabilities that sit in that company. Among other things, those liabilities can include tax liabilities, there may be outstanding rate liabilities and the like, okay? Uh, um, another example, and, and, and it's, it's come across my desk before, is client, client purchase shares in a company, uh, wasn't aware that the company was being sued by a third party, and because they had bought into the company, they needed to deal with that, with that claim that had been instituted against the company in, in, the, in the litigation forum. So with all of that said, Although in a perfect world, it should be a relatively straightforward and simple transaction, and yes, you can most certainly look to conclude it um, within a far quicker time period than a conventional sale, uh, a thorough due diligence is required. Okay, um, as, as a buyer, you need to do your due diligence. You need to ask for any financial statements that, that may be, that may be. for the company um, you need to get as highlighted earlier uh, there may be capital gains tax there may be capital gains tax implications uh, for the seller uh, typically sellers will have done their homework and, and will have their reasons as to why they would rather sell the shares after uh, the shares in the company as opposed to sell the property out of the company uh, um, whether or nature um, are to be mindful. Um, Hi all, I think that um, Andreas is just having connection issues. He will be back um, as soon as possible. Just Please just hang in there. Um, and in the meantime, if you want to, you're welcome to um, post questions. I see one or two interesting questions have already come um, through. So we'll address that at the end of his uh, presentation or otherwise um, you, bet you, you can ask the questions live as well. But please just give us a sec. Them. So yeah, bear with me for a moment. So guys, I, I had a technical challenge there, so I'm just looking to um, I'm just looking to get the PowerPoint back up. And I'll pick up where I left off. Okay, sorry. Just want to share my screen. There we go. All right, sorry about that, everyone. Just um, a challenge. So I, th I think before I lost connection then, I, I was just chatting about the, the challenges in securing the purchase price. As you know, in a, in a conventional sale, one would never pass transfer of a property without the purchase price being secured. Uh, so, in, in the context of a sale of shares, in my experience, although it is possible to secure a bank guarantee or payment of the purchase price on account of the shares that are being acquired, uh, the challenge that I've, that I've typically come across is that it's, it's not as straightforward as it sounds. The banks often 
have all sorts of requirements, uh, understandably so, when it comes to providing those types of guarantees. Um, and in certain instances, I, I have experienced that, that banks don't provide them. So it's, it is something to take into consideration. Obviously, if the bank cannot provide a, a bank guarantee securing payment on the purchase price, something that the purchaser would need to take into consideration is whether they can deposit that purchase price into the attorney's um, trust account. So just something to take into consideration. Uh, the first question I always ask myself is it fundamentally as, as it fundamentally changes the way in, in which we approach transactions of this nature is, who do you act for? You know, are you acting for the purchaser or are you acting for the seller? Um, both have got fundamentally different requirements, but nevertheless still want to um, arrive at the same outcome uh, in terms of which the purchaser will ultimately acquire the company that holds the property. Um, if, you, if you do manage to, 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 to find yourself in a situation where you have negotiated a deal with a seller um, who holds shares in a company and you've agreed to, to acquire the shares in that company. These are some important considerations for you to take into account. I mentioned, I briefly touched on this earlier, you will need to do a thorough due diligence on the company. Um, this includes tax-related affairs. Typically what we would do if we acted for the purchaser, we would ask the seller to procure a, a tax clearance certificate from the receiver of revenue receive a revenue just to ensure that the company is in good standing with SARS and that there are no outstanding uh, tax liabilities that that company may owe. Uh, I'd look to get any and all statements and, and, and uh, books of account. Uh, if, if you buy shares in a residential property owning entity uh, that is leasing out the property, for example, on Airbnb and money is being paid into the company's bank account, um, it would be prudent for you to get copies of the bank statements um, and the like. Uh, the other thing is, is <clears throat> it's important to do a, a legal compliance check um, when acting for the purchaser. Uh, what you need to, to consider is you would need to call up what we refer to as the source documents of the company. The source documents are typically your constitutional documents, uh, such as your company's MOI and shareholders agreement. Uh, just to ensure that there are no restrictions or specific procedural formalities that the seller of the shares needs to comply with when disposing of them to you as the purchaser. Um, among other things, and just by way of example, uh, if, if you were buying uh, shares in, in, in a company that owns immovable property and there are two shareholders and each shareholder holds 50%, um, you may have very well reached an agreement with the one but not the other and you are happy to take 50% ownership of the company. Typically, what, would, what one would find in the constitutional documents is in the shareholders agreement, there would be a right of first refusal, which the other shareholder would have um, against the shareholder who you have negotiated a sale with. So typically, how that would work is before the shareholder who you have negotiated a sale with can sell the shares to you, they first need to offer them to their co-shareholder. It's 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 unlikely to it's unlikely to occur in in residential property owning companies. Um, normally, you would it, it would be a hundred percent purchase, but it's it's most certainly not unheard of um, that you that individuals decide to only buy fifty percent of a residential property owning company. And if that is the case, you need to take into consideration whether, in terms of the constitutional documents, there are any restrictions or procedural formalities that you need to comply with. Now, just because it's not your conventional conveyancing transaction. And just because there is no actual transfer of the property, it doesn't mean that you as a purchaser should be put off by asking for certificates of compliance. Now, it's not a legal requirement because we are not transferring the property. It is only the shares in the company that owns the property that are being transferred. Um, typically, when we would act for a purchaser, we would advise them to insist as part and parcel of the acquisition of the shares that the seller provide uh, certificates of compliance as they ordinarily would um, in the case of a conventional sale. However, by law, it's not required in the case of a share sale. It's very important also just to make sure that um, you also procure the resignation of the shareholders nominated directors. Um, so in a company, what you, what you have is, is 
you have your shareholders who are typically your investors into the company, and, and then you have your directors who, who are responsible for the management of the company. Um, typically in a residential property owning company, your, your shareholders and your directors will, would be one in the same person. Um, it's not always the case, but, but predominantly it would be. And what you wouldn't want to have as a buyer is you buy the shares in the company, but you've forgotten to procure the resignation of the seller's nominated director. So effectively, not only must you buy the shares, you must also be prudent and procure that the direct that the seller's nominated director also resigns from the board of directors of the company and that you replace him in their stead. Um, just signing piles and, and, and something I alluded to earlier is where you buy shares in a residential property owning company and um, that company leases that property or puts that property out on Airbnb and, and is being paid funds into its bank account. Um, typically, there would be signing piles over the, that bank account that would be held by the seller. Now, again, when you buy into the company, buy into all the assets, all the liabilities, that company controls the bank account. But it's important that when you buy into the company as the purchaser, you make sure that you've got control of the company's bank account uh, so that the outgoing seller doesn't have control of incoming rental proceeds and the like. Now, what is not unusual for transactions of this nature where shares are acquired is for the purchaser to request certain warranties. Now, simply put, warranties are statement of facts. Um, they're also not uncommon. Uh, it, it's also not uncommon um, that they are requested in sell property agreements. Uh, in, in, in sell shares agreements, warranties are, are, are slightly more comprehensive because warranties are requested against the property um, as well as regarding the operations of the company. So typically, some warranties would include that the company has complied with all tax-related laws, it's paid all of its taxes, it, it's populated um, financial statements to the extent that those may be required by law, um, the company is not involved in any litigation, so on and so forth. So th these are aspects when acting for a purchaser, you need to do your due diligence and make sure that you have a properly negotiated agreement. Again, just to reiterate, sell shares, you don't require an attorney. You, it's, it's not a requirement that shares be transferred by a conveyancer. This is not a sell property agreement. Um, however, there are some transactional risks, which I mentioned earlier. And as you can see, just from these points that are currently up on the screen, th th there are several moving targets that one needs to consider. And again, it, it, it would be prudent to engage with an attorney to assist you to navigate it. Um, there's some important factors to, to consider when acting for the, the seller. Um, again, security for the purchase price. The reality is, is, is in a conventional conveyancing sale, uh, you would never pass transfer unless the purchase price has been secured. Same, the same principle should apply um, for the sale of shares. As a seller, you need to ensure that the buyer has secured the money and that on date of transfer of the shares, the um, the purchase price will be paid to you. In my experience, that can be dealt with in one of two ways. You can procure a bank guarantee. However, I did mention that it is challenging sometimes to procure a bank guarantee from the from, from financial institutions. Um, the, the easier way in which this can be administered is by the purchaser paying the money into either your either the seller's nominated attorney's trust account or into the purchaser's attorney's trust account. Typically, what would happen as part of these processes is, is the seller would sign over all their shared transfer forms um, to, to, to be countersigned by the purchaser once they take transfer of those shares. Um, the seller would sign those transfer forms. They would give them to their attorney. Once the purchaser's attorney has made payment of the purchase price for the shares to the seller, the seller's attorney would release the shared transfer forms, director resignations, and the like that I spoke about earlier. Other important considerations for a, for a seller to take into account is whether the seller would like to limit their liability. Um, what you wouldn't want to happen as a seller is that you've given all these extensive warranties that the purchaser has understandably requested from you, but you haven't put a time period and, and limited the amount that the purchaser can claim from you. So it's not unusual to see in a sale agreement of this nature that there are certain limitations of liability that are imposed. Um, typically, one would look to you to, to include something along the lines of, you know, if, if none of the warranties that the seller has provided, be it regarding the operations of the company, 
or the condition of the immovable property if a warranty claim hasn't been bought within a period of two years after the transaction has been concluded, the, the purchaser is prohibited from doing so. Uh, another typical warranty would be, uh, sorry, another typical limitation of liability would be limiting the amount of the claim that the purchaser can bring. So as opposed to the purchaser being having an open-ended claim against you, one can always negotiate that the claim would be limited to 50% of the purchase price that's paid. That's entirely up to negotiation and, and really just depends on the seller's risk appetite and whether they're concerned that there may be any skeletons in the company's closet that could come back to bite them based off the warranties that they've given. Now, the third bullet point, which speaks about the fact that the seller must be released from surety obligations, comes into play in the context where the company has, has incurred certain debts to, to a third party. And as security for that debt, uh, the seller, who is the shareholder of the company, uh, has provided a surety ship. Now, what you wouldn't want to happen as a seller is you sell the shares, you get paid your purchase price, but you've forgotten to be released from your surety ship that you gave to the third party for the company's obligations. It's important if you have given any surety ships that as part and parcel of the sale, First prize is, is that those surety ships, you are released from them and they substituted by the purchaser coming into the company. If you cannot procure that next best prize, although not always favorable, is, is, is to procure an indemnification uh, from the purchaser should, should the third party pull that surety ship up. Um, like the purchaser, a seller needs to consider the constitutional documents, needs to ensure that in any sale of shares, um, it has complied with any procedural formalities that the company's MOI or shareholders agreement um, may record. Among other things, uh, it's not unusual to see in some constitutional documents that a shareholder cannot sell their shares in a company without the board of directors consent. So if that's contained in the MOI or the shareholders agreement, that would need to be furnished, that consent would need to be furnished to the purchaser as part and parcel on the sale. Um, I, I spoke about earlier that these, these transactions can get quite complicated when bonds are introduced. And, you know, just speaking from practical experience, I've, I've, I've advised on transactions where no bonds are involved. Um, agents have received their commission within 48 to 72 hours of, of, of the parties signing the agreements because we never had to go into the deeds office. There were no bonds involved and, and, and for all sorts of reasons, uh, the purchaser was happy to do a, a share acquisition as opposed to directly buying the property out. Um, sellers got their money and, and, and the like. Now, the moment you start involving bonds where the company has got a, a bond registered over the property or the buyer needs to raise a bond in order to fund the purchase of the shares, in my experience, those transactions can draw out. Okay, and, and typically something that the seller needs to balance out and weigh, weigh out on a scale is whether they are prepared to wait um, for this process to be followed. Because when bonds are involved, whether it's a cancellation of a bond or the registration of a new bond, um, in my experience, it, it can almost sometimes take longer than what would be the standard time frame in a conventional sale. Uh, just because there are a lot of moving parts um, as I've mentioned, you know, to procure a bank guarantee for the sale of shares, it's, it can be done. It's not without its challenges. Um, and it's, it's not a straightforward process to procure those bonds. Now, just, just to give you an idea, if you were to acquire shares in a company that has got a bond, I mentioned earlier, not only do you buy into the assets of the company, so the property over which the bond is registered, but you would now also be responsible for ensuring that that company satisfies um, the bond repayments to the bank that has a bond registered over it. You wouldn't want the bank to foreclose after you've gone and paid the seller their purchase price. So typically what would happen is th there's one in two ways in which that can get dealt with. Uh, number one is the buyer, the, the purchaser acquires shares in the company and the purchase price may be X, but it would be reduced by the amount outstanding under the bond. Um, and the the purchaser would then simply continue as part and parcel to satisfy the debt obligations of the company. Um, again, that comes with its own challenges, whether it's permissible under the lending documents and the like, but that's just the one way in which it can be dealt with. The, the second way is where 
as part and parcel of the share acquisition, the existing bond is canceled, which means it's a deed office transaction. So now we do have to go into the deed office, despite the fact that there is no transfer of ownership of the property. And secondly, it, the, the, the company needs to register a mortgage bond to, to, to raise the funding. So it's, it's, the funding structure can get quite complicated because in a conventional sale, who's the individual that's applying for the bond? It would be the buyer. But, and, and the reason for that, simply put, is because the buyer would be the one who owns the immovable property following transfer. But in a share sale, and why it becomes somewhat complicated, is you as the, you as the buyer don't own the property, the company owns the property. So it would need to be the company that applies for the funding. It would need to be the company who registers the bond. But as you can well imagine, it, it becomes a bit of a chicken and egg scenario because in order for the company to apply for the bond, uh, you need to get the seller on board um, and authorize the purchaser to advance negotiations on the company's behalf to sign lending documents and the like. There, there are certain resolutions that the sellers are then required to sign on behalf of the purchaser. I, I'm not going to get into that. Um, it's, 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 it, it is quite challenging, but it's, it's, in my experience, sellers need to weigh up if bonds are involved, whether they are prepared to wait that it could even take longer than a conventional conveyancing process. I, I advised on a transaction earlier this year, just by way of example, where we didn't go the conventional route. The, because the seller was selling shares and, and not the property out of the company, he was saving in excess of 4 million rands worth of taxes. Um, if he had sold the property out, uh, he would have paid a lot more tax. Uh, this way, it was he was saving four million, and um, he was happy to wait. It, it, it's it's there, there were lots of strings that needed to be pulled, and ultimately, it, it, it took a, I think it was five months in order for, for for him to get paid. But he was happy to wait, and and, and the buyer wasn't in a rush either. Um, had it been a conventional sale, we would probably been able to wrap it up within eight to twelve weeks. So I, I just want to speak about transfer duty. There, there, there sometimes is a misconception that because you, you aren't transferring the property out of the company, um, that transfer duty isn't going to be paid. Um, today's topic is residential property owning entities. And without providing you with the exact definition and getting into the intricacies about it, um, a residential property owning company is classified as a company which, which, which has assets, um, which has assets of immovable property, which are in excess of 50, uh, which are residential in nature and, and which constitute more than 50% of the fair value of the company. So put differently and by way of practical example, if a company owns two properties, one which is worth, uh, one which is a residential property, which is worth 6 million rand and owns another property, which is commercial in nature, which is worth 4 million rand, that company is classified as a residential property owning company. Um, under, under our, our, our tax legislation, because in excess of 50% of the fair value of the company falls under residential property owning um, entities. Now, if I were to flip it around and the commercial property was worth 6 million Rand and the residential property was worth 4 million, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a residential property owning entity because 50% of the, in excess of 50% of the fair value lies with the commercial property, not with the residential property. Um, it's a separate discussion, uh, but if it didn't classify, uh, oh, sorry, didn't qualify as a, if, if the company in which shares are being acquired doesn't qualify as a residential property owning company, um, they wouldn't in fact be transfer duty. Um, they wouldn't in fact be that. Um, the sale of shares in a commercial property owning entity um, is is not this, uh, is, is 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 exempt from that. It's, it's not a vetable su supply. So that's 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 just some context. Um, as I mentioned, uh, a, a, a sale of shares in a residential property owning company does trigger the payment of transfer duty. How is that transfer duty calculated? Um, it's taken based on the value of the property. So it would be the market value or the purchase price that is being offered by the buyer um, for the shares, whichever is the higher. Um, how it would work is, and with reference to the fourth bullet point, is depending on the percentage of shareholding that you're going to acquire, that is how your transfer duty is apportioned. So 
by way of example, if you look at the, the, the purchase price of the property, and let's say that that is higher than the market value to use round numbers, if that purchase price was 100 Rand and you were requiring 100% of the shares in the company, uh, the transfer duty would then be based on 100 Rand, okay? Uh, and you would be, as the buyer, responsible for 100% of whatever the transfer duty value may be. If, however, you are only acquiring 50% of the company, transfer duty is still calculated on the 100 Rand, but you only pay 50% of it because you're acquiring 50% in the company. Now, I mentioned this at the beginning of the talk. It's not a requirement to give effect to the sale of shares that um, transfer duty be paid across to the receiver of revenue and, 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 and the like, as it would typically be required when you lodge deeds in the deeds office. Um, however, it is a legal requirement that within six months of concluding the sale, the purchaser pays the transfer duty across to the receiver of revenue. So although there may be certain savings by the purchaser, specifically on the front of the conveyancing fees, um, you would still, as the purchaser, be accountable for transfer duty, and it is important that you do your homework knowing what that transfer duty amount would be. So I, I, I just wanted to summarize what, what we've spoken about this morning. Um, generally, it, an acquisition of shares in a residential property owning company can be more efficient. Um, I've spoken about a perfect world where there are no bonds involved and we don't have to go into the deeds office um, and we don't need to involve City of Cape Town for rates, clearance certificates and the like. It's not a legal requirement in, 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 in the case of a sale of shares that you have certificates of compliance, but if acting for the purchaser or if you are the one who is, who's buying shares in that company, um, you can most certainly negotiate that certificates of compliance and the like be provided. It would be prudent to do so. Um, the process isn't without risks. Uh, although you can have all the warranties in the world against the fact that the company doesn't have liabilities and the like, you never know what might be hidden in, in the closet. Okay, uh, There could be some skeletons there regarding some litigation, which wasn't disclosed. Yes, you would always have your recourse, but you would still need to deal with it. That wouldn't necessarily be the case in a conventional sale. Um, we, we briefly spoke about it's, We briefly spoke about the importance uh, of taking into consideration who you act for whether it's it's for the buyer or for the seller. Um, in my experience, the way I approach an agreement is the very first question I ask myself is, who do I act for? Because the way in which I approach an agreement um, is fundamentally different to when I act for a seller to versus when I act for the buyer. And, and, and you can see how that was outlined in, in, in earlier points. Um, yes, it can be done that bonds can be involved, you know, Bonds might need to be cancelled because there is an existing bond over the process, uh, over the property, or that, that a new bond needs to be registered by the company because the purchaser requires the funding. Uh, I, I didn't want to go into too much detail about that because it, it's it's very complicated. Um, and, and, and you've got to have sort of on the ground experience as to what the banks typically require in those circumstances, and, and you need to be able to pull the strings accordingly. That, that again, though, would however require conveyances to get involved because of the of, of the deeds office transaction. And then it sort of begs the question: Well, if we're going into the deeds office, and this is such a complicated process where bonds are involved, would I, as a buyer, then want to go down that road? Uh, should we not then rather just do a conventional sale? Um, because there are there are risks involved with with, with doing a share a share acquisition. Um, okay, everybody. So those are just some high level points that that I want to share with you this morning. Um, Marina, I think that there may have been some questions and, and just left some time across for, for me to address those. Um, Andreas, thank you so much for a very, very lovely uh, presentation. There's actually been quite a few questions in the chat room. Um, so if you're happy with it, I'm going to take them from the top going down. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, the first one here was from Barry Furry. Um, he's asked, um, are you aware of any financial institutions uh, that are willing to bond share block shares no no uh very I, I can only speak from experience i've yet to come across it in in, in share blocks um the primary reason being is because you know it's the, the share block company that owns all of the units um in share blocks my understanding is is whenever you acquire shares in a share block you've got to have the cash on hand um it no 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 share block will allow a bond to be registered typically However, what one can look to negotiate, Barry, is that as opposed to a bond being registered over the unit, the purchaser cedes and pledges their shares um, in, the, in the share block company to the bank. 
Um, I've, I've only seen one bank accept that before. Um, in all other in all other um, instances that, that 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 I've experienced, share blocks are normally done on a cash basis. Thanks, Andreas. One question that came before that one, sorry that I skipped that, was whether generally what you were explaining here applies um, to share block schemes as well. It, Moraine, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Yes, it would. Um, you, you most certainly would need to do exactly the, 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 the same processes. The, the good thing with a share block is, is that you don't need to now concern yourself with bonds, okay? Because typically there wouldn't be a bond that's registered over the, the, the units. Uh, secondly, the purchaser doesn't have the right to, to to register a bond over that unit in the name of the company. But everything else that I've spoken about, it would continue to apply, including the fact that an acquisition of shares in a share block would still trigger transfer duty that needs to get, get paid. And you know, in my experience, a lot of the properties out on the Atlantic seaboard are, are, are structured as share blocks, particularly the units out in Camps Bay and Clifton. And um, those, those units, once those shares have been sold, um, typically, by the time the attorneys are done with the agreements, the agents have been paid and the like, normally seven days. You know, it can all be done really, very really quickly. Quite attractive solution. Thanks, yes, Andreas. Yeah. Um, okay, Anton, I hope that answered your question. Um, I'm going on now with Jean Combrink's question. It asks, if a company whose shares are held by a trust buys a property from a trust through asset for shares swap, can it be done with a loan account between the entities? Um, while there is still an outstanding bond on the property in the trust, will the bank allow this without the company having to refinance the transaction? Yeah, John, thanks, thanks for your question. I, I think it's quite a loaded question. I'm happy to yes. have a chat with you about it separately. I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with, 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 with Section 42 asset for shares structures in terms of the income tax package. Um, I'm actually advising on one this morning um, where, where bonds are involved and, and, and the like. And I, I heard something about trusts and loan accounts and, and there clearly seems to be some sort of claims that the trust would have against the company and how those get dealt with in an asset for share and, and, and the property has been bonded. How does one deal with all of that? Um, one's got to go to the bank. You've got to let the bank know what's going on. If you're going to be moving shares around, Typically, in terms of the lending documents, you can't do so without the bank's consent. Otherwise, it triggers an acceleration of, 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 of the principal debt and the like. Um, but, John, I'm not sure if I'm going to address your query entirely correctly. It, it was quite loaded. You're more than welcome to, to, to drop us a mail. And, 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 and you know, if, if there's anything further that I can perhaps clarify on that, um, I'll gladly do so. Except to say, if there are bonds involved, you know, the banks may consent. To there being an asset for shares uh, stock where the company where, where, where the trust moves its shareholding up into into a further company and is issued with shares in that company um, without needing to refinance. I have seen it; it does happen, but because of what's contained in the lending documents, you need to discuss it with the bank. And, and in any event, regardless, I, I wouldn't do it without having negotiations with the bank in the first place and letting them know what's going on. Thanks, Andreas. Um, I've got another question from Ibrahim. Um... Um, he's asking about the business side of sales um, with a property uh, making a profit. Um, I'm not 100% sure if that explains the question adequately. Otherwise, Ibrahim, you can post another question in, in, in the chat. Yeah, um, I, I, think, I, think, I think that would be, um, I think that would be useful, um, Marina. I, I think just perhaps maybe taking a bit of a, a shot in the dark here on Ibrahim's question. If there is a profit in the company, um, Ibrahim, and uh, normally what one would look to do is one would look to strip that profit out um, before the share transfer is is concluded. Uh, you, one would typically do that by way of of, of a dividend. Uh, there may be dividends with holdings tax that's that's applicable to that distribution. Um, but you know what you wouldn't want to happen is is if that company is sitting with a with a healthy profit, and um, you sell the shares in that company you know, for all intents and purposes, and if that distribution if that profit hasn't been declared out. The buyer is entitled to it, you know. So, it's 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 something. I think it's a good question. I'm I'm, I'm hoping I've, 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 I've taken the correct shot in the dark. But but if not, as Marina said, you're more than welcome to drop us an email. We have to clarify. Thanks, Andreas. Okay, I've got a question here from um, Debbie asking that you just highlight what happens if your purchaser is a non-resident and requires SARP approval for inward inward funds. Um, yes. 
Sure. Yeah. So, and so, and the so, timing involved there. Yeah, Debbie, I think that's a great question. So, you know, what would happen is is no restriction whatsoever on non-residents being um, entitled to acquire shares in a, in a residential property owning entity. It can certainly happen. Um, now, you would do exactly what you would do in a typical conventional sales process uh, where you would need to keep hold of your deal receipts and the like. Okay. You would need to, you must obtain SAB approval for, for, for the funds coming in and look to properly regularize the funds. Um, and, and what would happen as part and parcel of the process is when the buyer takes transfer of the shares, they are given a share certificate. Okay. You then approach Saab and you give them the, sh the share certificate together with the inward payments, um, as well as a loan reference number that, that Saab has given you, um, indicating the, the, the inward payments and the like. Saab actually endorses the share certificate as non-resident. Now, it's imperative that a non-resident gets such a share certificate um, endorsed non-resident. Otherwise, one day when they, if they decide to sell the shares, they're going to struggle to get their money out of the country. All right. There will be re repatriation issues. You can look to regularize it after the fact. Um, and then, Debbie, just, just on that timing, um, I've recently been to Saab, and that, and that took, took anywhere between 8 to 14 days. Saab is, Saab is quite efficient in my experience. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, last question I've got here is just a question around the various taxes payable and by the which parties. Um, sure. Shamuriza asked, um, so the seller pays or is liable for capital gains, the buyer will pay STT. Where does the transfer duty then yeah. fit in? Um, so, yeah. yeah. No, so absolutely. So, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great question again. Um, absolutely, your, your, your understanding is 100% correct. Um, capital gains tax is, is payable by the seller. Its shares are regarded as a capital as asset in nature just like immovable property. So following the disposal of shares, there will be capital gains tax that the seller needs to pay. Absolutely correct. There, there will be uh, STT, which is securities transfer tax, um, which the buyer needs to pay um, on the shares. STT is typically uh, a nominal amount, just, just for everybody on the, uh, on, on, on the webinar. Um, it's calculated at 0.25% of the purchase price of the shares. So to use round numbers, if you are buying shares for a hundred rand, the security transfer tax that the purchaser would pay would be 25 cents in, the, in, in, in that example. So, so it's a, it is a nominal amount. Obviously, the higher the number goes, the more it becomes, but absolutely correct. It is an additional tax that the purchaser just needs to budget for accordingly. And, and then just on the transfer duty side, uh, transfer duty would be for the account of the purchaser. The agreement that, that the parties um, put together needs to deal with it clearly. There's no obligation on the seller to ensure that the purchaser pays that transfer duty across to, to the receiver. It remains the responsibility of the purchaser to ensure that it's paid within six months of the sale occurring. Are there any more questions? Thanks, Andreas. You're welcome. Anna. Welcome to ask. Um, last question. Erin asks, um, sorry if she missed it in the presentation, but can you touch sure. on that implications of such a transaction? Yeah, yeah. again, great, great, great question. Um, so in, in, in the sale of shares in a residential property owning company, there wouldn't be that, okay? Uh, what there would be is there would be transfer duty and, and, and it all turns around on the definition of what constitutes a residential property owning company. Um, I, I earlier used the example of a situation where you've got a company that owns two properties, uh, one residential in nature, one in commercial in nature. If, if the fair value of the company, if, if more than 50% of the fair value of the company lies with a residential property, the, prop, the, the company is then classified as a residential owning company. Example, um, two companies that are two properties that are owned by a company. Uh, it owns six million rands worth of residential property and then four million rands worth of commercial property. More than 50% of the fair value then rests with the residential property and therefore it qualifies as a resident. It, it, sorry, it's classified as a residential property owning entity. If you were to flip it in reverse, it would, uh, and there was more than 6 million rand was sitting on the commercial side and 4 million in rand in the residential side, it, it would then be a commercial in, um, a commercial property owning entity, okay? 
And the, the implication of that is, is where it's not a residential property owning entity, a significant saving for a buyer, and, and that's a, this is a completely separate discussion because it becomes a commercial property, uh, a commercial commercial sale where, where the underlying asset is commercial in nature. But the 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 the, the sale of shares is not a battable supply. So for everybody who's on this call and and and, and does commercial uh, property related work. Something to perhaps consider, depending on the circumstances and bonds involved and, and everything else that comes with it that I spoke about earlier. In a perfect world, in commercial property sales, there can be significant savings for a buyer where they buy the shares in the company because they're not going to be paying transfer duty because it doesn't classify as a residential property owning company. It would be a commercial owning enterprise. And there is no VAT that is payable on shares because the sale of shares in a company of that nature doesn't it doesn't constitute a um, the, the sale of a vatable supply. So there would be no vat, there would be no transfer duty, no attorney fees, or no, 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 yeah, no attorney's fees uh, uh, other other than the um, the fees that you pay to the attorney to assist with the drafting of the agreement, but there wouldn't be conveyancing fees that are needed. Thank you, Andreas. Um, thank you so much. I'm Think those are the last questions. I don't see any more in the meeting chat, and we're almost at the end of our um, presentation. So I just want to thank you for an exceptionally informative session. Um, I learned a lot just listening to you again, um, and for everyone on the on the meeting. Um, uh, Andreas is at our Claremont office. You can contact him there. You'll find him on our website. So um, please touch base with him. These these transactions are, are attractive, as he mentioned, but but they they have complications. Um, and otherwise, for you'll receive a, a mail from our marketing department just with a recording of this uh, session. I see there's a lot of questions um, asking or a lot of requests for recordings. So that will be on your way. Um, and thank you for joining. And thank you, Andreas. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.